Hello and welcome back to another episode of For the Property Investor podcast and we're here with our our expert series and we have uh, certainly got an expert with us today, Aaron Wybrow from Strategic Mortgage Brokers. Hello, Aaron. How you going there, Owen? It's good to be on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I've been chasing you down for a while yeah. to try and get on, um, but you're a busy man helping um, all of our uh, property investors out there um, buy investment properties all over the country. So, um, yeah, glad to have you on now so that we can find out more about what's happening in the lending space for investors and um, how um, and how how you go about helping your clients. But let's start off. Um, First of all, of a um, bit about your backstory, how you started yeah. as a mortgage broker and why. Yeah, so uh, I became a mortgage broker back in 2012, and it was really from a trigger of um, needing, I needed a little extra money on the side. I was still working full time at the time, and um, I went through a problem where um, I wasn't, uh, a few years before that, I wasn't really educated in the finance space and I was actually not even in finance. So, um, uh, and I was able to get a bit more educated in finance and then I found that there were some issues and errors in my own finance. So I was able to go back and correct all those um, and then become a mortgage broker, get a little bit of extra money on the side. And then it's yep. turned into a full-blown career and business at the same time. Before I was a mortgage broker, I was selling medical equipment and I was an intensive care nurse. So very different field wow. um, to where I am right now. Uh, so have, yeah, I've have had you three, seen any cross yeah. any crossover yeah, skills crossover from there skills. to now? Yeah, it's it's the conception it's the concepts of the crossover skills. So. Um, it's, it's how we approach a client. So uh, today a client might come to me with some documentation, uh, a story and some goals that they want to do. And then there's these other things called some numbers on the page that we need to assess and analyze. So with the concepts over back in say nursing times, you get onto a shift, you walk into the ward and you've got these things called numbers on a screen. You've got some documents in front of you, like your supporting documents. There's people and a patient in the bed telling you a story and there may not necessarily be their goal is to get out of hospital, obviously, but there's a story, there's supporting documents and there's numbers and, and, and it's just how you interpret them differently. So uh, in the ICU, it's interpreting whether you need the resuscitation trolley. In the finance world, you're determining whether you need to escalate a file because there's a financial cool off or something mm. different going on. Tip, typically not really life threatening when we're dealing with numbers. It's usually just a timing thing. Mm. So that's it. So conceptually, it's changed a little bit. Selling uh, the medical devices, um, everyone sells, uh, whether you're selling to your child or you're selling to um, a partner or anyone to be able to do something. It's the same uh, having those skills in in business to sell um, and do your skill and trade is is a good thing as well. So from nursing to selling to mortgage breaking. Very interesting. I've yeah. um, uh, known a lot of mortgage brokers in, in my time. Um, I used to, I used to be one myself. And um, so, um, but I've never known uh, one to come from um, <laughs> that uh, nursing and medical uh, background to mortgage broking. So quite interesting. But um, um, yeah, so so you you started in 2012. Yeah. And um, it was a bit of a side hustle, side gig. That's and it. Um, and how did it progress from there? Yeah. So it's interesting back in, in 2012 through to sort of 2014, 15, we were at sort of interest rates that we're at right now, which is quite, quite interesting to um, think about. Um, and as it was a side hustle, it sort of built into being able to get to a position where I could go full time in the business. Um, and I think that took a, that took a few years. I was probably around 2018 when I jumped in full time. Um, and then we, we went through that big, big drop in the rates and changes in all the policies and things that came out, we had interest only things changed. We had um, remaining principal and interest terms. We had floor rates on ins- assessment rates. We had people that used to do, if you paid a thousand dollars on your mortgage and we only use that in the, in the calculator. Now they put all buffers in there. Um, then we had the, the thing called COVID, which knocked all the rates down and then it's all come back <laughs> in a different direction right now. So 
it was a side hustle for a bit and then I had the opportunity to jump in full time and and that's always a bit of a roller coaster if, if anyone's had um a a job and a side hustle before and you enjoy that that level of income and then you turn one full time you've got to be able to make up the gap and and that mm. can be that's that's where the challenge and the excitement of business is you could say yeah cool and um at and we were you always um working with property investors so uh, I was uh, I was working uh, with well I suppose in the early days it was people that came through the door to be able to get some get some commission run the business and help more people um, I suppose we're all property investors in one way or another it just depends on what the outcome is like if we're buying yeah, property true. to live in it may not be an investment right now but you never know in the future if you mm. sell it or change it into an investment and then we started start working with people that were buying in their super funds. Uh, in the early days, I started jumping into that pretty quickly, doing that sort of lending. So that was yeah. um, property investment. And um, I had people buying in their own street through to other towns, um, off the plan, things like that. So every, where we always working with property investors, we're, we're working with property and lending on property every day. So yeah, in the early days, it was more on the owner-occupied and then leveraging that into getting investments. And now we're yeah. finding a lot of people wanting to rent and then do to do investments mm. from there. Mm. And when did yeah. the transition happen from um, the the part time side gig to um, uh, being full time in business? Yeah, and so uh, that was um, that was in 2018. It was like um, I went through uh, the company I was working for went through a merger with another company. So the company I worked for got bought out, and um, they didn't treat the outgoing people in the uh, company they bought very well. Uh, so I took the opportunity to jump out of that role and jump full full force into um, mortgage broking. I was already yeah. riding a fairly decent amount of money before that, so I was able to then put full focus on that. So that was 2018, and then right. um, got into got into some um, business development stuff, networking, referrals, having coffees with everyone, and anyone I could talk to um, needed a loan in my my book, <laughs> even if they didn't. <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and now um, to today, you've yeah. got quite a sizable business with many staff. Yeah. yeah. So the in the in the business, um, the business has evolved from just myself and a mobile phone through to um, an office with um, five uh, five staff in Australia and and an offshore team. So we're sitting at about ten. 10 in the team at the moment, five yep. full-time brokers, which yep. is, which is pretty cool to be able to service um, yeah. the people coming in and give capacity to help more people. Yeah. Uh, in the last couple of years is when we sort of really, really focus on strategy around how does the lending work if you buy your own place and then investments, or if you buy mm. investments or you buy into different entities and how, how you can get the properties and then reshape it and manage it going forward and mm. not, not just look at the not just look at the transaction that you're doing right now, but look at something past that. Mm. And would you say that now, you know, you don't just um, uh, try to write, write anything that you can, but it's more about uh, specialising with um, particular types of clients? Yeah, so there, there is a bit of um, specialization coming into the piece on looking at investors and how we can help them purchase more according to their goals or restructuring, refinancing to be able to uh, help their portfolio costs less and yep. then look at that to then leapfrog into the next one. So we, we sort of see um, specializing in investors helps us not only help them even get their own place through to getting um, as many properties as they need to. Um, yeah. So yes, we are specializing more and more into investors, uh, yeah. but we still do, um, some of the other owner occupied things as well, which is okay. why we have a team to be able to bring that into. And you're, uh, then you've got your self-employed and commercial, um, <laughs> um, commercial lending as well. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one where uh, if you think about from, uh, an, an investor or a property investor side is that. Yes, we we need to find the engine room that helps us buy the properties, right? So it might be um, the self-employed person. It's usually their business and their engine room of their business there. And if that can be ramped up with different assets, 
whether it's um, vehicles through to uh, rent rolls, trial books, whatever it is that, that that business can have an asset in, if that can be ramped up and the customers through there can be ramped up and the cash flow can come through, that can usually flow through to their personal world of um, being able to build assets, not only building their business, building their assets on the side as well. So um, self-employed are great where you can go, cool, let's, um, let's get your business rocking and then let's get some assets on the side. So um, looking at that old vintage, do you do you sell your business to retire on, or do you have some assets along the way in both areas you, of your life? Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. And sometimes that's commercial. Sometimes it's the office that they're in. Sometimes it's um, uh, just some cash flow lending to get to the next project or front front run that. Because uh, let's face it, sometimes invoices don't get paid on time these days. Yeah. Uh, and then and then on the personal side, it's like, okay, cool. I've I've been able to bring some cash out of the business. Let's go after some property. Yeah. yeah. So it's all of the above. It's all of the above. So one. Yes. And it's the same with people that are employed. Like, um, you know, they might be training to be um, uh, a professional, whether business or or law or health or or property or even mortgage broking. They might be training up to be something, and then they have some certain amount of money now. And then in the future, they as they get into that role, they're going to have a bit more money too. So they've been able to bankroll or cash flow. Um, asset creation in their own lives as well so it's not necessarily just building up an engine room of a business it could be the yep. other side with career as well okay so let's get into what's happening in the now within the the, the <laughs> banking and lending space um it's because it, it does change all the time um from bank to bank and lender to lender of you know what what they um, of how much they want to lend and who they want to lend to. Uh, so, so what's happening now? What are the trends? Uh, there was a lot of change during the Royal Commission and then through the COVID times. Um, what, what's it settled into now and how much change are we still seeing? Yeah, so the, the and, now and specifically is... specifically for investors, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose the, the first thing that most people see at the moment is they're seeing like, interest rates in the sixes <laughs> so um for investors if if we're taking the um the stance of either principal and interest lending or the interest only lending we're looking at um sort of mid to mid to high sixes in in most um prime spaces of lending there are some variances different to different lenders but what we're also seeing in the lending space that most people will focus on the rate it's it's the highly publicized thing where every month the rba meets we've had lots of rate rises so interest rate is always on the top of people's tongues but when you when you break it down and you look under the hood of what builds a serviceability calculator which is the we could say that's the magical calculator that all banks have and they all compete in different areas mm. um, that's where all the variability comes in what they're going to give you how they're going to assess you what documentation you need to provide so it's not necessarily i can afford the repayment on uh, a six and a half percent interest rate it's actually what does the bank assess how many buffers are in there and yeah. then 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 once you know that you can get something then it's all 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 um, wheels to the ground to get the lending going. So what are we seeing? Lenders are cha lenders have more or less put most of their magical serviceability calculators online, so they are able to do daily tweaks on that. So what's today could be changed tomorrow. Yeah. Um, there's not just the interest rate, there's how they judge how people spend their money. So there's this thing called inflation that has jumped out there. Um, uh, petrol prices are up, everything's up, insurance is up, uh, in interest rates for the banks are going up. But as say groceries goes up, your household expenditure measure that the banks use as a responsible lending goes up as well. So a few years ago, those expenditure measures might be down, now they're up. So it's not just the rate going up, it's now the how they judge the expenses. Um, types of properties for investors, when, they, uh, when we look at um, properties, so if you buy a house with some land, you might have expenses like your rates and your water and your um, insurances and your property yeah. management costs but if you buy something that's like a strata property and now we've got to add strata in and they most banks will consider strata and property investment costs um, different and if you've got too much on the investment property costs well the impact of getting the rental income um, makes makes a lower impact on how much you can borrow so mm. the these things under the hood other than investment interest rate is what's driving a lot of where the borrowing is going to be and it's also driving the competition between the lenders as well 
yeah um with with the uh, people that are employed looking at buying and expanding their property portfolio it might be things like um, a bank might take 80 percent of their commission but another bank might take 100 um, percent yeah. your type of employment will change so if, if you're able to have those those all these little changes like you're controlling the costs on your properties you're controlling your um, expenditure measures to what the bank determines um, you're um, able to then go to go to a bank that's maybe going to let you get through and they're mm. only judging 80 percent commission and then you want to buy another property and maybe we need to go to another bank that says cool they're going to take 100 percent of, of of your commission it's going to change the outcome of what you're going to be able to buy absolutely and, and that's why if it if anyone still doesn't realize that's the strategic if we can use that word reason yeah. why someone would use a mortgage broker isn't it that's right so and and that's the thing, and and also you could take the higher thing is that um, uh, property investment's just a game of finance. Um, the property is pretty well secondary. Yes, you need to get a good property, but if you don't have the finance all set, how how are we going to go find the property? You could go mm. and fall in love with the property wherever you want, but if you can't afford it, what's the what's the point? Like we're better off yeah. spending time elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and and when you're looking at strategy on lending, it's more about. Um, not just looking at the first transaction you do, it's looking at the next one. So if you're going to, if we go to a lender that's very lenient on its lending, uh, when we go again for the second property, that lender is going to judge their their lending that they've already lent you um, more restrictive because it's a risk to them. So the lending to them is going to be a risk. So where we were judged favorably to get into the lender in the first place, then we go back to them again to borrow more money it can be quite restrictive. So sometimes it's good to get, okay, I'm going to buy one property now. Cool. What, what's your goal on this? Where, where are you going with mm. it? What do we need to do? And and that can even change, the, the borrowing capacity can even change from um, lender to lender and what repayment type you have. So traditionally, most people will go after interest only, but it could be uh, beneficial when you're acquiring properties to go principal and interest because you get a little bit extra borrowing capacity. And then when you've got all the properties you want for the time being, then you can go back and restructure things. So, um, and that's what we're seeing. And and that's where one of the other big things that we're seeing a lot of movement around the lenders as well. So what people acquire their properties on may not be what they have forever either. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's working out that strategy of how to acquire properties and uh, and then keeping them long term is it can be a different strategy altogether. That's right. So it's and, and that's why you need to have that good relationship with a, a mortgage broker to be able to assess from year to year what's changing in the market and lending policies, um, so that you you can make those changes when when required. That's right, and and don't just come to a, a mortgage broker or. A... Uh, whoever's going to find your properties without a goal. Well, mm. yeah, it's nice to get an investment property, but let's just not chase everyone. Let's have a goal with it. What are we, what are we trying to achieve here? Um, it could be as simple as um, I want to try to build a passive income or um, I've got, got some money to, to invest, but I'm better off investing in the property market versus any other assets. So it, it de depends what your goal is. Like some people come to me with uh, goals of, they just want to um, pay off their owner occupied mortgage. They want to um, retire early. They have a legacy for kids or they want to have a passive income of X dollars. Like um, nothing's wrong or right. It's good to understand what that goal is because if you go out then and you get the borrowing in place, this is where the, the second part comes in where what type of property. So if we've got the goals, we've got the lending, we've got the lending in the right way that goes and matches to the property. It makes all your property partners, buyers, agents, um, people really happy where you can go through that process and you go and go, okay, cool. Well, I just need to get property X and property Y, property Z, and that gets us our outcome. Then we fast through, forward through time. You may pay them off. Um, mm. You may sell them with the uplift of anything that happens there, or you may hold on to them and have a property portfolio paid off, which is an interesting thing about paying off debt these days. Not many people want to, they just want to have more and more and more. Yes, yes, more and more and more. Um, now, talking about that, uh, what if someone uh, is just starting on their mm. property investment journey? And young, old, or indifferent mm. might not matter, but 
they're in a position where they don't necessarily have an asset base uh, or much of it. They might have something to put towards putting to a to a deposit, um, and or they might not have much equity in, in a in an existing property. Um, how? What's the best strategy for getting started and trying to grow a portfolio from a financing point of view? Because uh, as as you just talked about, you know you, you can you can find all the best properties in the world to invest in, but if you can't get the finance, what's the point? Um, so how do we um, how do they go about uh, <clears throat> setting up that strategy to be able to get in and get started as quickly as possible and and grow it as much as quickly as possible. Yeah. So, so there's a couple of things that I, I see when people come to us or come to me to talk about uh, an initial call on, on how do I get started in a property investment or even buy their own property. Um, we usually find that the first one's the hardest because mm. it's, it's, it's a learning game. No, no one really teaches too much in regards to how, how debt works and puts it on properties and things and, and mm. how you can then, utilize different policies that are in the in the system and there's so much of it because that's the only reason they can the lenders can compete so um i i even had a conversation with a, a couple um yesterday where they they said to me where do i learn more of this stuff you've just gone through so much to be able to get our borrowing capacity done where do i learn more to be able to help myself Mm. um to help you and and not need to and just know more um and yeah it's it's looking at um podcasts it's looking at um some some knowledge out there it's looking at how your experience has gone with current lending and what your 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 uh, strengths are with uh, what risks you want to take on so we we have a first time investor come in um and they've got a deposit well, how do we get started? Well, borrowing capacity is the first thing to get started on. So understanding your goal and doing your borrowing capacity. And does that borrowing capacity meet some of the market requirements of your desired choice of property? Um, some people might have a, a, a preference on trying to get lower cost properties. Um, mm. Some people um, want to have a bit more of a decent property. So it depends on, and, 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 if you have too low of a borrowing capacity with too high of a rental income to be able to achieve it, you, you're probably not totally ready. So there's some recommendations that we can provide to get you ready. Or if you've got a reasonable rental um, price that you need to get in, plus you've got a good borrowing capacity, we might have to buy the property with a slightly higher um, loan to the value of the property, but at least it gets you started and we can get into the market. The other thing that we need to think about when we're jumping into property is that it's it's pretty well one of the it's one of the last hurrahs that people have to have this delayed gratification so like we go down to the shop if you want to buy buy some some new nikes or some uh, a handbag or uh, other clothes and you don't have much in your bank account most of the time you can just log on to afterpay or a, you might have a credit yeah. card or anything and, and you've got it so you don't have to wait for it you don't have to save up for that stuff anymore yeah. And with property, property is one of these things that is a delayed gratification area. So it takes time to get prepared to get it. Then when you, if you need to offload it, you've, you've paid these things like stamp duties and legal fees on top of it. So you might've bought a property for half a million dollars, but it cost you $540,000 to get it. So yeah. when you go to get rid of it, you've, you've got to try to make your money back up, right? So it's the time between purchase and the time to sell. So that's going to t be a long time as well. So, mm. and then you might find that if you're on fixed incomes or there's something not too variable in your income, you might have to buy the first property. You might actually have to wait a period of time or save up a bit more deposit in addition to what the property is doing as well. So it's, it's a bit of um, understanding what you want to do as a goal, understanding your borrowing capacity, understanding how you can save money and then also recognize that property investment is a is a delayed gratification game it's not like we can go to the shop and just buy it and then sell it and yes. go again so yes yeah what 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 if you had the scenario where um someone's got the ability to either buy a property to live in and or mm. um or continue renting and and starting to build their property portfolio as a rent fester yeah um, and what are the differences and the advantages? Um, yeah, purely from a let's take away lifestyle choice and and so on from the choosing to mm. to, to buy to live in, purely from a numbers and finance point of view, 
Um, what are the advantages of both? Yeah. So if there is one or the other, there, there's no, <laughs> yeah, excluded the uh, personal choices. Obviously, there's yes. no wrong or right way to to buy property, like yeah. buy property to live in, buy property to rent. Um, in the current, currently, right now, with the interest rates where they are, and the rents where they are. So if you if you're renting in in Sydney, you probably are seeing, or you're owning an investment property in Sydney, you're probably seeing rental yields down under the three percent. Mm. Um, in some other areas, your rental yields might be up over five, six, or seven yeah, percent in in places. So, when you're renting, say, in a major city where you might be working and doing um, doing your job, your rent, uh, say, on a eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar property, say around six hundred, six fifty a week. Um, when you go to buy that property at a high, if you've got a limited deposit and you buy that property with a limited deposit at a high loan to value ratio. You might find that you're going to be paying not six fifty a week to hold on to it. You might be paying seven fifty, eight hundred a week on just the mortgage alone, uh, let alone thinking about the council rates and water rates and repairs and other things that may need to go into the property. So mm. when you're when you're looking at where you need to work and where you need to live, and then buying an, uh, your own property you can strip out all the emotion and you can go, okay, well, does it make financial sense hmm. um, in where I need to live to to work? Or can I live in a lower cost area where you're probably better off buying a property to live in versus renting? So Yes, but that um, might not be convenient from a work point of view. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's where the combination. If you if you have a good deposit and you want to buy your own place go and it's going to be less than rent, Cool. The, the best way to yeah. make properties um, cash neutral is to have no debt on it, right? Yeah. So, so if you have no debt on it, you either get good rental income back for yourself to live from, which is where some of the goals of passive income comes from, or you have lower costs on the property compared to renting it. So mm. it's it's comes down to how we want to balance it. So a lot of people that have limited deposit or they're starting out their property journey uh, sometimes can well, not sometimes, all the time, you need to consider the dollars and cents. Like yeah. If you're going to pay an exuberant rate on your mortgage, it's a higher loan to value ratio and you still want to invest, it's probably going to slow you down for a long time. Okay. If you've if you've got lower rent on a property that is great and a great job to support you then to save up money or get some money to be able to start investing, you can then flip it around. You can rent in a high cost property for a good amount of money to your budget and a good job and then you can take a lower amount of money which could be a slightly higher deposit in a in a different state or a different area or, um, to be able to start investing because the numbers like a a tenth uh, what is it a hundred thousand dollar deposit on a million dollar property or a hundred thousand dollar deposit on a five hundred thousand dollar property so those yeah. equations change the outcome yes but for yeah. most people who are um you know they're, they're living where they need to work Mm -hmm. and they're living where they're close to friends and family and where they know. Yeah. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't want to move out of the area just to be able to buy somewhere cheaper yeah. um, so that they can live in that. Um, at, or it's just, you know, it would be too impossible from a from a work point of view um, to be able to do the work that they need to. So they, they're really stuck in this cycle of needing to rent where they need to live. Um, but a lot of people see it as a negative thing still, but mm. there still is a lot of advantages to um, continue to rent where um, you need to live and being able to buy investment properties to get in the market and and um, build your um, asset base that way, isn't there? There, there is, and I think it's a couple of things to think about when, when if you feel like you're stuck and you want to be in the same area over and over again, where you have got a good job and you got a got family, you got friends, you got everything there, and it's such a and and the property prices obviously in Sydney you can reverse time and they're lower cost, and you can come back to today's time and they're higher cost. Um, you you that's a that's what's in between your head. Like, mm. um, was it rent money's dead money? That's a, a common statement that I get yeah. when people are wanting to buy it's their own place. It's an old-fashioned statement now. Yeah, yeah, old old-fashioned statement. And then when you when you when you can rent a property for three thousand a month, or you can buy a property that's two hundred thousand dollars less of value and have to pay four thousand dollars a month on the mortgage alone, and the the money talks. That's another yeah. statement there. Money talks. 
Rent yeah. money's dead money. Money talks. So we're getting some cliches well, today. Well, well you, you were talking about the rental yields in Sydney being under 3%. You yeah. know, let's call it 2.5%. Essentially, yeah. you're paying the same as interest only on that property with zero deposit, except for mm. maybe the four weeks bond, um, which is a minuscule deposit. Um, and in comparison to the value of that property, uh, and you're um, essentially paying interest only at 2.5%. And you yeah. don't have to pay any of the um, outgoings and expenses on that property either. That, that's right. And then that helps you supercharge savings capacity, other, other things like that. But then there's a mindset shift from the people wanting to buy their own place in Sydney um, and not wanting to rent in Sydney. The mindset mm. shift is, I don't, I, 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 I'm fearful of being an investor. Yeah. How am I, how am I going to do that? How am I going to talk to people like yourself as a property manager? Um, do I have the power over things still? Can I do, do I need to repair things or do I need to pay someone else? Uh, am I going to get the right amount of rent? Is the rent going to come in time to pay the mortgage? All these little things can come up about how you can manage an investment property or stop, or it doesn't mm. it prevents you from getting an investment property. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask as well was, um, it's uh, looking at the stats. There's a, there's what seventy five percent of all investors only have one investment property, mm. and then it's um, something like less than ten percent have three or more investment properties. Mm. So, um, so there, there's a huge gap there between um, the 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 people who only have a few properties. <clears throat> to mm. people who have many. Um, and I've heard it time and time again from people who, uh, from a borrowing capacity point of view, they seem to <laughs> max out at two, three, maybe four properties. Mm. Um, and it's somewhere between that range where they just go, yeah, it's just impossible to borrow more money. Even though I've got the equity, I've got good income, my my um I'm getting good income from the property as well as you know my per personal income. You know, I don't see any reason why I can't borrow, but the banks just don't seem to, you know, it, it's it's just maxing out. Um, can you explain why that happens and and <laughs> how and how can investors um um get around that if if at all? Yeah, so so You've got a, you've nearly got a week's worth of podcasts just sitting in that question there. Uh, and, well, yeah, okay. we got we got another five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so with people getting past their first property onto their second property, or even third or fourth, to get out of the seventy-five percent of investors always only have one property. How do you get to the next one? Well, it's it's. I feel like there's a bit of a, a mind shift, a mindset shift. Uh, before you even get the first property, this is where we, I did say the statement before that finance, uh, properties investing is a game of finance with a few properties in, put in there. But if you but if you pick the wrong properties, you might get stuck. Hmm. All right. So there there are areas um, in Australia, for example, uh, if you bought um, uh, back in sort of 2015, 2016, say in Perth, and then you're trying to get equity out in 2017, 2018, you may not have the right property and you may not have any equity. It might be negative equity. So oh. if you have a negative equity situation and a high LVR or loan to value ratio situation, um, uh, a high rent, you're probably not going to get the equity out to help you get to the second one. You're going to be probably stuck there. And if you potentially buy the house down the street of where you're living in with the wrong rental yield for you and the wrong the wrong value for you and it sucked up all your savings and it's sucking out one to two grand a month out of your, your your pocket you're probably not going to be able to get to the second property so yeah that choice of property um is is a key thing about what's it what's it going to return on the cash flow do you have the money to afford to hold it um what's it going to do to your, your tax position so this is where if you want to get past your second if your first property this is where the whole the little bit of a teamwork thing comes in like we might, if you're self-employed, we might need to get draft tax returns and have a look at where we're sitting. Uh, we might have to have a conversation back in January, February to have a chat about where you're sitting profit and loss wise to be able to open up the lending and prepare for things instead of looking like you're a, a pauper to the tax man. So preparation comes into it, the team comes into it, the right properties come into it to be able to go past the first one or time comes into it. So even, even some of the uh, more poorly performing properties may still perform over time. You just got to wait a bit longer for it. 
So mm. that that comes yep. into it. And then the borrowing capacity cap thing. Um, yeah. Well, well, this is where the borrowing capacity caps, um, it's, it's how they build the calculators. So everything's in that magical serviceability calculator, right? When you go to a bank, you want to borrow more money and you're going to pay 6.5%. The bank's going to assess as if the rate is nine and a half percent. So they're going to add three percent on top of that. All right. So there's already a buffer put in there. So your actual repayment you pay to your mortgage might be a thousand bucks, but they're going to consider it's like eighteen hundred, two grand. Yeah. Even though your reality is different. On yep. the rental income, um, for every hundred dollars you get in rental income, um, some banks will take seventy five percent of that. So that's seventy five dollars, and some will take ninety percent, which is ninety dollars. All right, so out of uh, out of $100, let's give the benefit of the doubt, you get $90 a week in rent onto the calculator. Then they're going, what does it cost you to hold the property? What's your management fees? What's your insurance? What's all that stuff? So now we're going from $90, now we're back to 80, back to 70, back to 60, back to $50 a week that's impacting your calculator. But that's not your reality. Your reality is you get $100. Every $100 of rent, you get the $100. You opt yeah. to pay professionally i'd say you have to pay your property manager because it just takes a headache away so yes you pay your property manager it's good to have the insurance it's good to have that but the reality is it doesn't tap you all the way down to 50 bucks every property no. the reality of the dollars is different to the buffers that are built into the calculator and the buffers the more buffers in the calculator the worse the borrowing capacity outcome is going to be but sometimes the tougher the calculator the cheaper the interest rate mm. So when you want to open up your borrowing capacity, this is where you have to diversify your lenders. Um, we said before, 80% commission to 100% commission. Um, we could do, with self-employed, we could do one year's financials versus an average of two. So that can significantly change the outcome of the borrowing capacity. So yep. are we actually borrowing capacity capped or are we just don't look at all the other lenders that compete for your business to give you a bit more money Mm. And and why would we want to borrow more money? Is that safe? It's it, it's this is where if the bank's willing to give you a million dollars, but you don't feel comfortable with that, and you only want half a million, guess what? You're you're in control of your own borrowing as well. So it just depends on your risk appetite. What's what your mindset is around property investing, and with borrowing capacity, we we have to look at things like diversification of our lenders. Um, we have to look at whether we can invest in other areas and we can borrow, we can borrow from a legitimate borrowing sense. We can borrow in companies, we can mm. borrow in trusts, we can borrow in super, we can borrow in our own name. We can split the ownership up. We can borrow in the wife's name. We can borrow in the husband's name. And all those things have a conglomerate of lending policy and calculations that will change from you being able to borrow nothing to you being able to borrow 2 million bucks. So it's about getting a little creative if you need to. Strategic, and, I say. <laughs> yes. Okay. Strategic, and um, and yes, the the cheapest rate isn't always the best rate. That's right. Be so because there there can be a lot of asterisks uh, uh, um, that come along with that rate um, that say that you can't borrow as much as you want to either. Does it? That that's right. And and it's not. So if you if you came to me to look at your borrowing capacity. I want to know about you first and what your circumstances are, mm. because that allows me to figure out which policies are going to fit to you. And there might be many policies that fit to you and many banks that go along with it. And then yeah. after we know that, then we know which lenders we're going to be scrutinizing that have the policies that match your circumstances that open up the lending for you. Yeah. Because it's no good just going to a bank that's got a good low rate because who, who doesn't like a bargain these days? And then you fall in love with a property or you like the numbers of an investment property and then the bank says no. What, what are you going to do? Jump out of the branch and then walk down the road? You've got to start the whole conversation again. Yeah. So, so I work on a principle of person, policy, product. So once you've mm -hmm. finished talking with uh, one of my team about it, it's about you, you know that you're going to be paying 6.29% because of a reason. You're going to be paying 7% because of a reason. Um, so that when you turn on the news and you can go get a nice low rate, it's you go, no, no, I didn't qualify at that bank. I, I qualified at this one. And it helps you mm -hmm. get through. So person product, policy product is what we work on every day yep. in, day out. And then matching okay. it to your goals. Yep. It's um, you pay the price to get the result that you want in the end and um, you don't pick your price first. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the other way to over, overcome your borrowing capacity problem is what's happening in the future? Are you getting a promotion? Uh, have you got more business coming in? Um, uh, can you, uh, with self-employed people, it's either an increase in income or it's a decrease mm. in expenses, right? There's, there's many businesses out there that might get a million dollar turnover and they spend $999,000 of it or a yeah. business that earns 400 grand and only spends 20 grand to get it. So the profit yeah. changes and that changes your outcome too. Well, Aaron, that's been a lot of information <laughs> and yeah. a lot, lot of valuable information. Geez, we um, we did talk for a while, but um, it's um, uh, but yeah, a lot of valuable information. If anyone wanted to um, uh, reach out to you and yeah. to be able to see how they can get some help, um, how did they do that? Yeah, so the the best way to reach out to us is it's as it spells strategic mortgage brokers com.au will get you to our website or you can always drop us a phone call on the uh, on the landline it's uh, 02 um, we we have a team of people we have a great process to put you through to get you to your goals of your next property or even your first one so um, mm. that's how you can reach out to us we're more than happy to have a chat uh, and see what we can do and what we can re recommend for you okay Great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And of course, if anyone wants to be put in touch directly with Aaron um, uh, and and um, the Strategic Mortgage Brokers team, um, please reach out to ourselves and we can um, uh, do an introduction as well. So um, thanks, Aaron, for joining us. A lot of uh, good information there uh, to help investors and borrowers in general. And um, yeah, glad to have you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Good to be on the podcast, Aaron. Yeah.